Good morning to each of you. Thank you for being here this morning. What a beautiful crowd you are. To those that are online and by conference call, we're happy that you join us as well. It is the last Sunday in February. This has been uh, the month of love, and it uh, is quickly drawing to its conclusion. It may be odd, especially if you're visiting this morning, to think about the month of love talking about the devil, but that's what we've been doing, dealing with the devil. How do we do that? Well, if you're visiting this morning, that's what we will be considering. We're happy that you're here. We hope that you'll give us the opportunity to get to know you a little better and uh, even join us as a part of our family uh, in this place. We're trying to love God, love people, and serve Him. To do that, we face an enemy. Evil is in the world, and you know that. And we're trying to understand a little bit more about maybe the real leader of that evil, the evil one. The devil himself. Now you have in your mind maybe a caricature. You think of a little guy in a red suit. Maybe he's got horns and a pitchfork. But the Bible never presents him in that sort of imagery. But clearly he is at work in our world. And in these lessons we are not attempting to give him any honor or praise. We are attempting to learn more about him. Because the Bible tells us that we should not be ignorant of the schemes, the plans that he has, the devices and the tools that are at his disposal to destroy us. And so we want to know and understand more about him. Now, again, much in the way of folklore and fable has been through the years uh, prompted by a number of little incidents, maybe like this one. Uh, these guys are both Johnson guys. Now, they're not related to each other, but if you've ever heard someone say, you know, they sold their soul to the devil, uh, Robert and Tommy, uh, again, of no relation to each other in Mississippi in the earlier part of the last century supposedly did that at a crossroads in order to be able to play the guitar better. Well, uh, there's probably no factual information as it regards uh, that actually occurring, uh, but that just goes to show you and illustrate again how we sometimes, I think, unintentionally minimize the actual existence of the one who opposes us. Now you may say, well, I don't want to know anything about the devil. I don't want to be involved in that. I want to hear about good things. I want to hear about God's love. I want to hear about what Jesus offers. And I assure, assure you, I want to know the same. And I want to share the same. But you see, sometimes we feel like maybe, well, I'm just a spectator. I'm not going to serve the devil. So why should I know anything more about him? Maybe I can just sit on the sidelines, as it were, but that's not possible because each of us have to make a choice. We are in a battle every day. This life is a war. And for our children, that may seem like a bit of an overstatement. It may even sound a little scary. But what we want to know and what we want to see from the Word of God is there's no need to be frightened. There's no need to be afraid. The one who is on our side and whose side we should want to be on, that of Jesus Christ our Savior, has won the victory. And through him we can too. But we face an evil opponent. All the way back on April 3rd, 1965, Paul Harvey, uh, a well-known radio commentator, uh, he made uh, a little presentation and he just simply made this statement by way of introduction. And then this was his concluding statement. But he introduced that radio program that particular morning by saying, If I were the devil... If I were the devil. Now, it was only a hypothetical sort of thing. He knew that he wasn't. He wasn't claiming to be. But if there is an evil being that opposes that which is good and right in the world, how would he operate? And you can read the entirety of Mr. Harvey's transcript. It'll only take you four or five minutes at the most uh, because he con condensed it for his radio program. And what he was observing, of course, was the culture of his day what was going on in various arenas, the political arena, the realm of education, entertainment, all of the things that impact us day by day in our lives as well. And it's so very, I almost say it's almost intuitive and almost in a sense prophetic, not that he was inspired by God, but it was uh, certainly very keen in his observation, Mr. Harvey was, as he noticed the things that were developing all the way back in 1965 in our culture. And he looked kind of down through the ages of what the result would be. And sadly, we're seeing some of those presently and maybe even, uh, even worse than that. But he concluded that particular radio program in this way. And I think it's a fitting summary. If I were Satan, that is, if I were the devil... I just keep on doing 
what he's doing. That's a scary thought in some ways, isn't it? Mr. Harvey recognized that there was much in our world that was not as it should be. And he was, I think, although not with a particular maybe religious inclination, yet looking at the evils and the ills of our world and society, asking people to again consider the ways of God. I want to do that this morning, but again by looking at the one who is our opponent and looking at this guy, this entity, this being, whatever he is and wherever he came from, known as Satan. Satan, a word that appears 54 times in your English version. Again, if you're reading a different version, it may appear a few more, a few less, but 54 times, 14 in the Old Testament, 40 in the New Testament. In the New Testament, it is the proper name for the devil, if you will. And um, that's just how the Greek translator, the Greek writers of the New Testament understood the Old Testament word and then how they uh, used it as a sort of proper name for this evil opponent that we face. In the Old Testament, it is the description of a being that may or may not be malicious in some ways. Now you may say, why would you even suggest that? I thought you said he's evil, he's mean, he's opposed to us. Well, really what we're saying is that the word itself means an adversary. An adversary, one that opposes, or an accuser. That's the idea. And in the Old Testament, we read that this term can be applied both to people that we would consider to be good, maybe, and those who would not. Let me just take you on a quick survey through your Old Testament. You can turn to these passages or just listen as I read them to you to show you how this Again, entity, this being, whatever it is, uh, can sometimes be described and sometimes not even describing that being at all. For instance, in 1 Samuel chapter 29, the man that we will know or come to be known as King David is working or living with an enemy group known as the Philistines. Those that opposed the Israelites, the people of God. And so David was with them because the king of Israel, King Saul, was no fan of David. And uh, so there's just this kind of uh, unique hostility, both between Saul and David and between the Philistines and the Israelites. But now Saul is pursuing the Israelites and the uh, Philistines, or rather, Saul is leading the Israelites as they pursue the Philistines and the Philistines uh, engaged in battle against them. David's kind of caught in the middle. And the Bible says when he's with this enemy group, at least prior uh, knowledge, this enemy group of the Philistines against God's people, uh, they're not wanting David to join them, at least when the battle commences, because they said, make him go back, make him return to the place which you've appointed for him. Don't let him go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become our adversary. How could he reconcile himself to his master, if not with heads of these men? That is, he's a secret agent. Almost is what they're suggesting. If you like spy movies or spy novels, uh, that's what they're saying. He's just trying to work insidiously behind enemy lines. And when the battle starts, even though he appears to be our friend, he's actually going to turn out to be our enemy. So send him back. In Numbers chapter 22, you have the very, very interesting account of a man by the name of Balaam who is hired as a prophet of God to curse the people of God. Now, God says, don't go. That's not what I want you to do. Balaam persists. The money, the sweetening of the deal by the individual that wants to hire him, Balak, uh, he finally convinces, it seems, Balaam to join him on this mission to curse the people of God, even though he is a prophet of God. And amazingly, God allows him to go. But as he goes, and as he nears the location where he is to pronounce this curse, as it were, the Bible says in the Old Testament book of Numbers, in chapter 22, verse 22, God's anger was aroused because he, Balaam, went, and the angel of the Lord, whoever that individual might be, took his stand in the way as an adversary. That's our word, Satan. The adjective form, against him. He was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. Now, kids, you might remember this is the amazing Bible story, whereas they keep going and uh, Balaam continues to be opposed. Uh, his donkey tries to obey God instead of Balaam, his master. And uh, Balaam's not happy with his donkey and he just he gives the poor old donkey a whipping. 
And um, in response to that whipping, uh, the Bible says uh, down about verse number 28, the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. And she, the donkey, said to Balaam, What have I done to you? You've struck me three times. Why are you whipping me? And amazingly as it is, or amazing as it is to consider that the donkey spoke, it's maybe even more comedic, that Balaam talks back. You know, he wants to uh, have a word. He's not going to have any donkey disrespect him. You've abused me. If I had a sword in my hand, I'd just kill you. But I'm your good donkey. The donkey says basically in return, I'm trying to spare you. Well, that's interesting, but the angel of the Lord was an opponent, was an adversary, was one who stood in the way of Balaam going and doing what God said not to do. There is an interesting account, again, in your Old Testament, in the book of Zechariah, a book you've likely not read this past week, and I've not either had I not prepared for this lesson. I'll go ahead and tell you. But this time in the people's history, that is the people of God's history, they had been enslaved. They had been in bondage. They had been carried away from their homeland to the area of Babylon. Now the Babylonian Empire has been replaced by the Medo-Persian Empire on the world history scene. And God's people are sent back to Jerusalem. And they're trying to restore their society, their way of life. Their religious um, very existence is hinged on what they will do, whether they'll listen to the ways of God or not. <clears throat> and so God dispatches men to kind of give them encouragement, motivation to again be what God would have them to be. And Zechariah is one of these prophets prophesying in the reign of King Darius, uh, the Persian ruler. And in Zechariah chapter 3, Zechariah the prophet has a vision, a dream. The Bible often describes these as a way that God can communicate to his people. And the Bible says that he saw Joshua, the high priest, standing before, and there's this individual again, or this being again, the angel of the Lord. Satan stood at his right hand to oppose him, standing as an adversary. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. It's a brand plucked from the fire. Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, standing before the angel. And he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, Take away the filthy garments from him. To him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. Now, again, you're probably off scratching your head saying, Well, what, what is this about, really? And I'll admit there's a great deal of mystery about what's going on here. It seems that maybe <clears throat> the idea was that the people had got into their mind, We have been so disobedient to God. We have... Uh, lived in a way that violated his covenant. We have been evil. We have been wicked. Will he ever receive us again? Will he ever love us or forgive us again? And even now, the symbol of our religion itself, Joshua the high priest himself is unfit to serve in this role. And yet God says, the one who accuses, I'm not going to listen to those accusations. Satan, you adversary, you cannot keep me from fulfilling my loving covenant to these people that I choose. I will yet offer them forgiveness. I will still offer them my mercy. One final thing before we settle in one Old Testament book. If you go to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 21. 1 Chronicles 21. I mentioned David to you a little earlier when Saul was pursuing him. David by this time has become the king of Israel, replacing Saul. And this is at a time when God has given him great success... And the Bible says in First Samuel or First Chronicles, rather, chapter twenty-one, verse one, Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number to take a census of Israel to number his troops. And you may say, well, what what's the problem with that? Although it's not explicitly stated, it seems to have been done maybe as an act wherein David could brag and say, "Look at me, look at my power." Look at my abilities with this army that I possess. And maybe he could point to other things in the inventory of power uh, that God had granted him. But David may have been taking too much credit for it himself. Now the Bible says here, Satan stood up against Israel. Maybe in some, why, some way, some wise he provoked or incited or stirred or urged that action on the part of David in this matter. What's even more perplexing is the same account of this episode, recorded in 2 Samuel 24, verse 1, says that the Lord moved David to do this. And a lot of questions like I have, you probably have, regarding free will, regarding coercion, regarding decision-making, 
all of that I want you to simply maybe dismiss from your mind just at this point in the lesson. I want you to think about this. We have one who opposes us. That much is sure. We have one who is an adversary. And one who may even be guilty of accusing us. Even in the sight of God. And where that really comes into bear, at least in a discussion, uh, maybe is the question that I pose here for you. Is it the case that all trials and troubles are the result of this evil being, the work of the one that we call Satan? Are all the troubles and trials of life? I know that you have a lot of troubles and trials. Why do I know that? Because I know that you're living in the same world I'm living in. You live in the same world that I live in. Now, it may be the case that right now, your troubles and trials are fewer than they've been at other times in your life. And probably a lot of us can give God thanks that that's the present circumstance we enjoy. But it may very well be that some of you are right now in the midst of a trial or a struggle, a difficulty, and you say, it's very difficult. This is a valley. This is a low point. This is a struggle indeed that I'm not enjoying even in the least. So what do we do in those moments, whether we're on the mountaintop as it were, or we're in the valley, whether times are good or bad or in between? What do we do with trouble? What do we do with trial? Well, sometimes what we do is that we try, most of the time in fact, I suppose, very quickly to eliminate it from our lives. Suffering is something that we just want to have no part with, and so we want to eliminate it as quickly and as much as possible, painlessly as possible. And we may even say there's nothing good in this. And we have to be very, very cautious. And please understand, I'm trying to use all of the tact that I can use uh, when I make these statements this morning. And if by chance you're one of the ones that is that is in a situation where struggle is very real and heartache is very heavy and the burdens seem almost unbearable. Please know that I'm not trying to be callous or crude. I'm not trying uh, to be un insensitive or unsympathetic in the least. But is it the case that it's just the world that we live in, the evil one that's in it, that causes all the trials and troubles that we face? There's one case study. and You might have guessed already that this is where I would go. If not, please turn in your Bible to the book of Job. It looks like the book of Job, but we say Job, that's his name. And maybe you've heard his story before. If you've not, I want to introduce him to you this morning. And I want you to see in his life, maybe a mirror of your own. And if not at the current moment, I want you at least to be informed. And maybe in days to come, years in fact, into the future, it may be that this will be a lesson that you can look back on with benefit to say, I remember something about trouble and trials, suffering and pain, difficulties that I face. What do I do in them? Who do I blame if I blame anyone? Who do I give credit to if I should even give credit to them? Last week, we talked about the evil one and we said that sometimes in life there are things that we just shake our head in amazement and say, I don't understand. And what that causes us to do sometimes, and we mentioned, I guess, as I did at the previous hour in the Bible study class, you see the devastation, for instance, caused by the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. And you see the suffering that has impacted uh, people in that region and the billions of dollars in damage to property, to physical things, are inconsequential compared to the loss of life and the injury sustained. And we just shake our heads in bewilderment and say, I, I don't understand that. How could that happen? Why would God let that happen? And with you, I too shake my head in almost disbelief. I could give you some philosophical answers. We could talk about maybe this is a natural world. God created it perfectly. We know that. But because of sin introduced by this evil one, God did curse it. said there would be consequences from sin. Natural processes are at work. Even from the judgments that God has made in the past, for instance, in the flood and the reconfiguration of the earth and its climate and its structures. We could talk about all of that in a philosophical, abstract way. And if you were in a college classroom or in a seminar with other people that are great intellectuals, that might intrigue you. But that's not where we live. We live just watching the news on our couch and saying, how could that happen? And we're left to shake our heads saying, I don't understand. And that's okay. Because when I turn to the book of Job, I'm introduced to a man. And I hope you're there. You can find him in your Old Testament after the book of Esther. 
We're just told that he's a man in the land of us. Where is us? We don't know. Who is he? He's Job. Who are his parents? What is his genealogy? We often have that information supplied in Scripture. None of that is given. I think purposely so. We don't know where he lived. We don't know who he is. We don't even know when he lived. Some suggest he might have lived, if you know your Bible stories, at the time prior to the flood. The pre-Diluvian world, as it's called. Maybe he lived uh, in the aftermath between the flood and the Tower of Babel, another cataclysmic event of God's judgment in the past. Maybe he lived as a contemporary in the time of Abraham. He's one of the patriarchs. Uh, maybe he lives in the time in which uh, the law of Moses is operative. We just don't know which of those answers is correct. And really, it's not important that we do know because his story is a universal one. Now, you may say there's no way that a guy that might have lived 4,000 years ago how his life relates to my life, how his story intersects with mine, how his family situation is going to have any bearing on mine. Don't reach that conclusion just yet. Because here is Job, this man that we don't know where or when he lived or who he was. But we know this about him in verse 1. He's a man that feared God and shunned evil. I suppose it's the case that you're here this morning because you want to be a person described in the same way. Now, by chance, if you're here for some other reason other than that you fear and respect God and want to shun evil, then please talk to me afterwards. But I'm supposing that all of us are here this morning because we want to reverence God. We want to respect God. We want to find out something about what He wants us to do with our lives. We want to turn away from that which is evil and wrong. We want to turn and try to be people that are right. That's who we want to be. And that's who Job was. And Job was that in an exceptional fashion. He's a father, he's a husband, seven sons and three daughters. He's a man that has great wealth. Now, there you may say, well, he departs from me. And given the amount of wealth that this man had in that time period in history, wherever it was, again, most of us would say, I don't have that level of wealth by today's standards, equivalent, and you're right, none of us probably do, but still we are wealthy people given living in this country as we do and enjoying uh, the blessings that we do at this time period in history. But here's what begins to happen. The Bible says even though Job is a righteous man, a man that respects God, in verse 6 the Bible says the sons of God come to present themselves before the Lord. These sons of God, later on in chapter 38, will be described as those who were there when God laid the foundation of the earth, when God created. Now that's an amazing thought to ponder, isn't it? Presumably then they are angelic beings. They are something that is not of the physical realm like you and I are. We have a date of birth. We have a date of death. We are not eternal. We have 70, 80, maybe a few more years for some, even less. But our time and our sojourn in this life is brief. But these individuals, these beings, these spiritual entities are different. They are able to come into the very presence of God. And notice verse 6, Satan. He comes among them. Now again, you're maybe scratching your head. How can, if this guy's the bad guy, can he show up where the good guys are? And that's a question that deserves some consideration, maybe further study than what we can give it this morning. But I want you to notice what happens. We're not necessarily told if he's a good guy or a bad guy. That's our assumption. Uh, but the Lord asked him, that is the God, our Creator, our Heavenly Father, where do you come from? Well, Satan says in verse 7, I've wandered to and fro, on the earth, walking back and forth on it. And then here's God's question to this one we call the adversary, the opponent, the accuser. Have you considered my, God speaking, my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth. He's a blameless and upright man. He fears God and he shuns evil. Wouldn't you love for God just to make that evaluation of your life? If he were in discussion with whomever else he'd want to be in discussion with, have you considered my servant, and your name is uh, mentioned next, have you considered my servant in Crossville and Cumberland County? They fear me. They shun evil. Well, Satan now, his maybe accusatory work, whether he's doing it maybe as some sort of private investigator role in God's counsel, or whether he is actually in a malicious way asking God in response, does Job fear God for nothing? Does Job fear God for nothing? Is that a valid question? Well, 
this opponent thinks so, because he goes on to say, have you not made a hedge around him? He's not talking about greenery on your shrubs out in the front yard. You've put a protection mechanism around him and all his household. On every side, you've blessed the work of his hands. You've increased his possessions. God, why wouldn't he serve you? You've let him live a charmed, easy, blessed, affluent life. That's the charge of this being we know as Satan. To God, who first posed the question to him about Job. Further, he says this, by way of accusation, perhaps in verse 11, Stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he'll surely curse you to your face. This is something that begins, because I know how the story unfolds, and most of us do, that begins to send the shivers up our spine. Take away what he has. Take away your protection. Let him suffer some. Bring pain into his life. Put a trial before him. Make his life anything but easy, God. You'll see what Satan says. Amazingly, God consents, verse 12. Sometimes this is called a wager. It's not really a wager. There's no payout for either party. But really, it's the question of the integrity of Job and whether or not he believes in the integrity and faithfulness of God over against this one who is opposed, who is the enemy, the adversary, the opponent. Go, God says, all that he has is in your power, only don't lay a hand on his person. So Satan goes out from the presence of the Lord. To fast forward through the rest of chapter 1, here's what happened. Job loses everything except four servants, in essence, and his wife. Everything. His assets wiped out in a moment. His financial wealth evaporates in an instant. All that he can hear in successive fashion are his servants making the report, Job, it's all gone. I'm the only one left. Now you might be thinking, well, I'd, I'd hate to see when I click to check my bank account that it just had zeros in the balance line. I'd hate to know uh, when I got a knock at the door that my home and my property were being repossessed. I'd hate to see my car being put on the back of a trailer and taken away. I'd hate to lose all of that, but at least I'd have my family. And that might have been Job's thoughts too. Until the Bible says one final servant runs in. And Job probably knew the message he would deliver before he said it. Job, here's what I hate to tell you. Your seven sons, your three daughters, they were enjoying a party. The type were not told. Maybe it's a birthday party for one of the grandkids. We can just make assumptions like that. Speculative uh, are these guesses that we might uh, have. No matter, Job, they were all together and there was a great whirlwind that came across the wilderness. One of those unexplained weather phenomena, Job had hit the house. All four corners simultaneously and that house collapsed. We still sometimes see news stories that report the same sort of ordeals and incidents in our world presently. Job, here's what happened. It fell on the young people and they're dead. All of them. I alone have escaped to tell you. Now, what would you do just to try to imagine yourself receiving news like Job did? Verse 21 tells us what he did. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job, how do you do that? That's not right. You need to blame the devil. You need to say this isn't fair. This isn't just. This isn't right. Chapter 2, the same process that was described in chapter 1 is repeated with Satan back in the presence of God. Well, God just kind of says, see, I, show, I told you. Well, yeah, Satan says in essence. But if you touch his person... Oh, you can take away what a man has. You can even take away his family, but affect him individually. See what he does. God says, have at it. And so this time, we're not sure of the nature of the disease. Medical experts have debated it through the centuries. What happens? Job has boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Painful boils. Probably a combination of a variety of different illnesses. And there is no relief. The only relief that he can have may be from the incessant irritation that they cause is to sit in ashes 
where a fire had been and take a piece of pottery and maybe scrape off that flesh that was decaying. And in the moment that it was scraped off, just like if you have a scab, that moment when you pick the scab off just to keep it from itching, there's a momentary, just a brief respite until it returns again to irritate you. And here Job sits night and day. His wife, we often criticize. I don't know if that criticism is fair. Now, I don't agree, neither does Job, neither should we, with her prescription. But maybe she's only trying to be merciful. Thinking that, as his friends will later accuse, and as we often do, God, this is all unfair. It's unjust. So what good does it do for me to live? What good does it do to have evil and pain and suffering? Why does it do any good to try to serve God when life is so difficult? Curse God and die. Just get it over with, she says. But here's his answer. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. The opponent continues to try, we assume perhaps to make other attempts at Job and his suffering. The uh, chapters that follow, chapters 3 through the end of the book, record Job and his friends debating back and forth uh, this age-old question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Who is at fault? Who's the evil one there? What do we do? And the temptation that I think uh, here Job's friends were trying to invest into his mind and that the devil still tries to inject into our minds is we serve a God who doesn't care. A God who, uh, if, he doesn't, uh, if he does care, uh, maybe he's too impotent to do anything about it. He either doesn't care and doesn't love you or he's not powerful enough to do anything about it. So why serve him at all? That's still the temptation. That's still the solicitation in the thinking of millions that the devil succeeds at planting in their minds. Now you may say, well, why should we avoid that? Because if we avoid that, then we restore a measure of confidence in our God where it belongs. Chapter 42, or excuse me, chapter 41, um, verses 2. It is chapter 42. I've got it wrong on the screen. I thought I did. So make that correction. Chapter 42, the very last chapter of the book. Job, after having an actual encounter with God, will never have that. Never learning what had happened between Satan and God in the first two chapters. God shows up and in essence tells Job, I've got it under control. Trust me. I'm still in charge. Job, to his credit, then says, I know he's speaking to God that you can do everything. No purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I don't understand. You see, sometimes we get in a mess of our own making. Our trust is misplaced. Our understanding, our knowledge of our own abilities or understandings are insufficient. And Job understands that. Through verse 6, he'll make other things saying, I, I just needed to be quiet. I need to trust God. Lord spoke these words to Job, then he also spoke to those three friends, especially to Eliphaz, but to the other two, my wrath, God says, is aroused against you and your two friends. You have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. So you need to go to him, you need to uh, consult with him, and he'll, he'll make it right with me. He'll offer sacrifice on your behalf. Now, amazingly, in verse 11, all his brothers, that is Job's brothers, sisters, all that had been his acquaintances before, all that had rejected him, all that had turned away from him, all that had probably made fa false accusations against him, they finally come to him. They console him. They comfort him. For all the adversity, please notice this language, that the Lord had brought upon him. They even bring him money, as if that would be a sufficient comfort. That's just one of those interesting details thrown at the end of verse 11. The Bible says that the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning. Twice as much was given to him. Those children not replaced uh, with twice as many, but with an additional seven sons and three daughters. This time the daughters are mentioned, not the sons more beautiful than any of the women that lived anywhere else. What's the point? What we come away with, uh, with this book, is an age-old, again, dilemma for all of us. When trouble comes, when... Uh, adversity strikes when there are burdens to bear, when there is sorrow or sickness, what do we do? About all that we can do is trust God. And whether it's the evil one that brings it upon us, 
or just the very act of God in somehow indirectly allowing it, we have to understand His control is unquestioned. His love is not in doubt. God's care for you is available to you. Now, I want to take you to two final verses and the lesson's yours. And what I want you to take, and next week we'll begin to talk about how the devil actually operates. Some of you have asked, when are we going to get to what, the de- what, the, what does the devil do today? How does he act? Why do we need to avoid him and how do we avoid him? That's what next week's lesson is going to be primarily concerned with. But I know many have wondered, well, what is his origin, his development, his duty? God's word does not leave in doubt his destiny. Revelation chapter 12, there's much in this chapter that is certainly... Uh, difficult to try to decipher as it relates to what the writer John is seeing and recording for us. And the book of Revelation has been a playground for people to have all types of wild theories about the future and the past as well as the present. I'm not going to engage in any of that this morning. What I do know is that the Bible says that there is an evil one, a serpent of old called the devil and Satan. He deceives the whole earth. He was defeated. Look at verse 8. That's the only verse I want you to focus your attention on this morning. Speaking of this evil one, the Bible says they did not prevail. That's all I want you to take. They did not prevail. Have you noticed that we live in a time when so many people feel as if they are helpless in the face of evil? We feel defeated with no ability to overcome or to resist We bemoan the fact that the world is wicked and sinful, and it is. I'm not debating that. I know. I watch the news like you do. I encounter people in the world like you do. But sometimes we give up and we sit on our hands and we have a pity party to say, God, there's nothing we can do. We can't overcome. We can't resist. We can't help our children uh, resist these temptations that they're put before them. We just have to go along with everybody else. In some way, somehow, maybe God will do something. I don't know what. No. They could not prevail. That is the evil one. And the message of the New Testament is through Jesus, we can prevail. We will prevail. We will win. Jesus has been, and through Him, we will be victorious. Here's James chapter 5, verse 11. I want to leave you with this caution. And then again, the lesson is yours. James says, we count those blessed who endure. Having a hard time enduring this morning? Feel like you want to give up? Feel like the world is kind of, you know, opposed against you and there's uh, no way that you can resist it or you can overcome it or you can withstand it? We count them blessed who endure. You've heard James's recounting, and we've heard it still this morning, of the perseverance of Job. And seen the end intended by the Lord. What was that whole ordeal about? I have my guesses, but I'll take what James writes by the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit as probably the right summary. You've seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Now let me caution you in this way. We look at the story of Job, and you may have heard uh, by what I said and reached this deduction. Preacher said... Life's going to be hard, but eventually somewhere down the line in this life, it's all going to be right and I'll have even more than I had to start with. And all of these negative downturns and this uh, setbacks uh, I faced, God's going to turn them around. That's a tempting way to interpret the book of Job, but that's not the promise of it. It's not merely a physical, earthly, temporary time on this earth that God is going to do those reversals. Now, He may. He may very well, that's what he did uh, in the book of Job, so as to restore him to an even higher place, better place than he was before. But I think James is asking us to consider the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. He's talking about more so eternity. He's talking about something yet to come. He's talking about what we enjoy through Jesus. Those of us that know Jesus, that love Jesus, and that serve Jesus. That the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And even though we have an enemy, we have an opponent, we have an adversary, we can overcome him. He will not prevail. He will not prevail. The question this morning then echoes back to what we started with. You're not a spectator in this battle. 
Life is not a spectator sport. You cannot sit on the sidelines and say, okay, there's the good folks out there and there's the bad folks. There's the folks that serve God and there's the folks that serve the devil. But, you know, I'm just going to be neutral. I'm just going to sit back and watch how it plays out. And maybe at the end, I'll step in and decide to be on the good side. That's not how it works. Every day, we make a choice. Every day, uh, we decide which side we'll fight on and fight with. Whether we'll submit to the one who is evil or serve our God who is faithful in Jesus, his son, who has won the victory over sin with us through his death. First John 3 verse 8, this is the reason that Jesus came. He appeared to destroy the works of the devil. And there are many. We're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about death. We're going to talk about deception. We're going to talk about uh, all of the ways that he attempts to uh, deceive and to trick us and to delude us into believing something other than the truth. But Jesus, his way is right. His way is true, and He is the only one through whom we can have life. Do you enjoy that this morning? And do you have the assurance that even though there is one who opposes you, there is one who is greater than He who has already overcome Him and won the victory, who offers you that victory through His blood, His death on your behalf? That's Jesus. That's the victory we have in Him. Even the song sometimes that we sing, Oh, victory in Jesus. You need that victory. You need that confidence. And you need to live every day in a way that is submissive and obedient to him so as to enjoy it. Even now this morning, if you're not a Christian, we want you to consider very carefully and in a very serious way uh, why you should be one. Not because this preacher says you should. Uh, not because uh, someone else, even in your life, uh, tries to give you that encouragement. But because you realize the love that God has for you displayed through his son's death on your behalf. His blood shed on the cross that should have been uh, your penalty to pay for your sin. But Jesus did it instead. He loved you and he won victory uh, by his death on the cross, by his victory over the tomb. Three days later, he was alive again. That's the same hope we have. that We will one day too be alive forevermore, eternal life in his presence. A wonderful place called heaven. How do you take advantage of that gift? How do you receive it? You hear God's word and you believe it. That's the message of the gospel. We give it in just a condensed fashion this morning. We'll study with you and even more with you how to let you see that in a more expansive way if the need is there. If you believe it, will you turn your life and its control over to the Lord? Repentance is a Bible word that simply means I'll change my mind and I'll change my thinking. I'll, I'll decide to live for him. I won't stand on the sidelines. I'll get involved and I'll be on God's side. There's where the victory is. I'll confess my faith in Jesus as the Son of God and I'll be buried with Him in baptism. Because in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the very people who had killed Jesus, who the devil thought he had succeeded in helping uh, defeat the Son of God, the Savior, realized in fact they had only made their own fate, their own separation, their own sinful uh, deed. Uh, such a terrible one that they cry out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We're guilty. We're, we're going to be defeated along with the one who was defeated by the death of Jesus. Can we be forgiven? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You'll receive the remission of your sins was the promise made. And that's still, if you comply with those instructions this morning, the wonderful promise you'll receive. What about those of you and those of us who are the ch uh, children of God trying to live the Christian life? Be encouraged. Be continually uh, aware of the one who has won the victory for you. Yes, there's an enemy. He's the devil. And yes, whatever ways in which he works and whatever uh, means by which evil comes into our life or the trouble or the trials, the struggles, uh, will we have to face an ordeal as Job did? I know not. Some of you may have already faced a struggle like that or even worse. But Job remembered. And God even said by way of commendation, he spoke what was right. He, he put his trust in me. He didn't understand always, but he continued to faithfully serve me even when times were hard and difficult. And maybe you're at that spot this morning. It's hard and difficult. You need prayers for strength to do better. Maybe that you've, again, you've switched sides. You've got on the wrong side, the losing side, the devil's side. Even after having served with the Lord before, then repent of that. Pray. You have a merciful Father who uh, still loves you, who still wants to give you the victory through His Son, Jesus. And that's what we want for you more than anything else as well. The opponent... Yes, he is Satan. Yes, he opposes us. Yes, he is an adversary. But Jesus is the victor. And through him, we can have the victory too. And if that's the need that you have to receive that this morning, make that known to us and come while we stand and sing together.